What's up guys? Today we're gonna be reacting to yet another Jubilee video. This time it's their Spectrum series, and this one's titled, What Do Black People Think About White People? They brought together a group of white people, a group of black people, and they're gonna give them a series of statements where they decide whether or not they are on the strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree side and then we'll unpack them. I already see a familiar face in this episode, but before we get into that, we have Taylor in Nashville. Hey, I'm not used to white people being asked to chime in on things and weigh their opinions these days. So uh, it's interesting, <laughs> it would be fun to watch and participate. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, of course, I don't know which side I represent, uh, being that I am half black and half white, but for mm. now, since we have the white part casted in Taylor, I'll figure out the black part and we'll, we'll respond from that perspective. Guys, let's watch. I went to a school that was predominantly black when I was growing up. And when I first saw the first white kid, I was like, what is that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I act differently around people who aren't my race. Pause. I act differently around people who aren't my race. I don't think so. I think I'm pretty much the same around people regardless of race. This The question is specifically people who aren't my race. There's not that many people who aren't my race. If I run into a white person, you're my race. If I run into a black person, you're my race. Uh, Hispanics and Asians, I don't treat them any differently. What I would say is around uh, some black people, there's a bit of code switching, like there's certain slang uh, that black people use that typically white people don't, uh, and maybe I'll code switch a little bit when I'm around black people rather than when I'm with white people, but for the most part, you're gonna get, you're getting what you get, guys. I'm here all week. Taylor? <laughs> yeah, I think like at its core, you should generally be the same same person, uh, yeah. no matter who you're interacting with. Right. There's a little bit of like, you can you know, as a, as a means of reaching out to other people or finding common ground, either you can use your knowledge of other cultures to like build bridges and, and talk or in and, and different ways. Like mm -hmm. uh, I grew up uh, a missionary kid. I lived in Brazil, Panama and Honduras all for around a year, a little more, a little less, um, but each in three different instances before I graduated high school and being immersed in these other cultures, uh, you, you, learn a lot about other people, but you also learn kind of how to communicate and relate to people. And I think that using those tools is like, you know, we can call it emotional intelligence or whatever. So mm -hmm. I think there's an innocuous way to do it where you're not like doing it in a, a racist way. And, right. um, but overall on, on the level of like your character, who you are as a person, you shouldn't be like putting on a front or changing just to uh, fit in. Yeah. And you know, there, there is an element of just like, just being aware of your environment and playing to that environment without changing who you are as a person. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with code switching. You guys let me know what your example is of code switching. I recently saw a girl on TikTok getting flamed, an Indian girl, because she has TikToks where she talks with what we would typically associate, uh, you know, white people talking like, although I'm, I don't really love that characterization when people say that. And then she has videos where she has a more uh, Indian accent in, in her voice. And people were saying, how dare you? You're utilizing the Indian accent when it benefits you. And she's like, yo, guys, I'm just, I'm just code switching, which is a very real thing. Uh, so weird thing to get upset about. I digress. Let's hear from the people in this Jubilee video. Three, two, one. I think the most important thing is just to authentically be yourself. And I don't think being around people who don't look like you should be a reason for you to act any different. Yeah, for me, I guess it's like um, within the confines of like the workforce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was thinking code switching. Because if you show up to a, um, a meeting talking like this, they're like, uneducated got it they'll use the slang to sell the products and to tweet and to get the clicks and stuff but like as soon as a worker's there who's authentically from the area and talking like people from the area it's like ooh, we don't like that you know because it's always like well be yourself until you yourself and then it's like oh i don't like yourself unfortunately in a lot of the areas of work it's like you you almost have to like lie to these people to be like i'm a robot i'll like you know I love your company. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's sick. It's sick. But, but it's, it's like, true. you have to do, it's, you, it's you know. It's true. Like, yeah. I feel like coach. I'll pause for a second there. 
I can see where he's coming from. <clears throat> Let's do it again. Sorry. I can see where he's coming from in that uh, he might use slang, A-A-V-E, as like, you know, left-leaning people call that day, African-American uh, vernacular English. And he'll use that when he's out like with friends or with his family. But when you come to work, with the, which is hopefully a space of a uh, professionalism, you would not bring uh, that slang with you. Now he makes the point, well, they use it for their tweets, they use it for social media, they use it to sell the product, but when I'm functioning within the business, uh, they don't want you speaking like that. I would argue that like social media and a business workplace are two very different realms that call for different, you know, language. And if you're trying to advertise to a social media audience, maybe it would be good to use things like slang. If you're trying to do business with people, maybe it wouldn't be. And I, I think he's being fair in, in his assessment that you do kind of have to be two different types of people. He just seems like he harbors a little bit of animosity towards that fact when really it's just a, a fact of life. When you're working in a business, you carry around with you a certain degree of professionalism. And that means you can't bring your your slang or, you know, outlandish character uh, to the job unless that really services you in some way and brings you more clients. That's what they they care about most. Yeah, I think to the degree that you are bringing your authentic self to work and it is not at the expense of professionalism, it's totally yeah. fine. But whenever you're using the uh, veneer of authenticity to justify, you know, not being professional, then that's where we have a problem. And it's just as a simple matter of good business and, and being productive and getting things done that need to be done and, and representing the company well and its values well, whatever, uh, that that comes first in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. um, but you can be yourself so long as you're not compromising the uh, atmosphere and the productivity that's supposed to be going on at the workplace. Yeah, I think it's just as, as simple as that. I think we're going to, they're going to get into this a little bit more. So let's see how people respond to this and take his, his point. Switching is one part, but also like there's certain parts in my own community that aren't accepted that when I'm around different people that look like me, I can express myself differently. Like I feel like if I talk a little proper, sometimes I get a little slack for it from my side of the family. But when I go into the world, sometimes I like EDC. I like tech music. I like, you know what I'm saying? See, for me, I feel like that's a very interesting point there um, because there is often the accusation thrown out, oh my gosh, you act so white or you talk so white. And with the way she talks and the fact that she says like, I like EDC, I like, uh, you know, electronic music and things like that, that's typically associated with whiteness. The way that she talks is typically associated with whiteness. So I would imagine me and her share a very similar experience in that many people would like accuse you of acting white or like, playing to, to white people. Uh, a lot of people with the way that I talk or because I like musical theater, they say, oh my gosh, you are, you're acting so white, like you're, you're not black, like who raised you, all these different things, which is just, it's just ridiculous. People have different interests and to speak properly should not be associated with being white. I'm like, do I need to turn in my white card? Because I've heard of EDM, but I've never heard of EDC. What is, what does that mean? I feel like I'm uh, less white than you guys. I thought that point. was, I thought that was like an electronic dance like festival. Isn't isn't that what the EDC? Oh, okay, is? it's a fe it's a it's a festival, but EDM is electronic dance music. I knew that much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So EDC. I didn't know that was a particularly thought of as a white thing though either. Yeah, I would I would typically I, I would imagine if you were to go to like any sort of. EDM, EDC, like little thing going on that predominantly white people would be there. Uh, there are a lot of Asian friends I play volleyball with in LA that are crazy about the EDM music. Right. So I'm just saying, let's not exclude hey, people, but no. I, it's I, a I diverse get it. I get bunch. It. It's a diverse bunch. <laughs> I'm just wondering who makes up the majority of it, sure, I would imagine. Sure. Um, but yeah, for those of you guys who don't know, EDC is Electric Daisy Carnival. There we go. We learned a little something. Keep watching. It has nothing to do with race. It more has to do with just being professional. Like if I'm at work, then I'm obviously going to be a little more proper, you know. I recognize Xavier, by the way. Xavier's a personality at PragerU. Shout out to Xavier. Uh, he makes some some good videos. He makes some good points. 
a little bit less slang and all of that and just more careful with my rhetoric, but I don't think it has to do with race. The only thing I will say is like, I work in political media, so I'm on camera a lot. So people already know who I am and what I'm coming with. But that being said, it's like when I'm around other black people, because I'm a Republican, sometimes they tend to be really standoffish with me or think that I don't understand the culture and all this different stuff. So sometimes I have to feel it out like, are these people who are just gonna call me an Uncle Tom or are these people like I can actually just keep it all the way real with? So that's the only time I feel like I act different because of race. You know, I, I also work in political media, but as a leftist, and I honestly feel like I've definitely benefited from being able to be in spaces where I've been able to be authentically myself, and I definitely think that's a privilege, especially where I, like, grew up is just, like, something that's regularly happening that people have to go through. But personally, I think I've been able to, especially now in a business side and now my new workplace, I feel like I don't have to adapt my language to make people, like, respect me or understand where I'm trying to come from, you know? At what point is it like, damn, we can't even really have conversations without buttoning up and being like, oh, this is how we, we have to ha talk like this because so they'll listen or like, mm -hmm. regardless yeah, as But do you people, think that's racial or do you think that's I just... I think, I don't know that just, if, I don't know that it's, because I'm right, I know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> you see me, we see I know, I, I, I think, you know, I know exactly where he's going. I don't think it's intrinsically rooted in race, but I think just the way the social genetic makeup of people are, I think just by way of, people of specific races speaking a certain way or being perceived a certain way, it just, it tends to be more often than not rooted in race. Interesting, because I, I've never really made that association. For me, it's like whenever I hear corporate speak of any kind, it just sounds, it sounds inhuman to me. Like it doesn't, I don't associate it with any particular race or associate it as being exclusionary to any sort of race. But like, whenever I hear corporate speak, it just sounds like, just like AI drones. And I can understand like going into work at a company and just saying like, oh, I'm so over having to be buttoned up and to speak in this way and to, to be so proper all the time. But I would imagine that that's a shared experience amongst, you know, most people working in a corporate environment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it reminds me of like when the Smithsonian came out and they're with their big the DEI display and they were talking about white supremacy and how things like showing up on time and math are white supremacists. Like who's making that association? It's you. These are just sort of objective realities that are out there. And so mm -hmm. when it comes to corporate speak, it's like things just need to be communicated. It's an impersonal thing. You're reading the racial dynamics into this that really aren't there. Right. Like when somebody says uh, you act white, well, wait a second, what does that even mean? What does it even mean to act white? And why are you making an association between these two things uh, and connecting them to whiteness? That's really the big question for me. Uh, why do you, why do you connect this uh, professionalism that you have to have in a, in a corporate atmosphere or that buttoned up nature that you have to have with whiteness specifically? based off of like urban black Americans. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. most people have barriers they put up when they get introduced to a new group. I went on disagree instead of strongly disagree because like there have been situations where I get introduced to a group of someone of a different race. And like, yeah, at first I'm pulled back, but once I get comfortable with them, those walls come down and then, yeah, that's where my true self comes out. For me, it really uh, depends because uh, I've been shooting music videos in the hood, so I really need to basically adopt myself to become a black person. So for me, it's not a problem like meeting new races. I always like vibe and chill with people. Do you think adapting yourself to those different ethnicities is like something that's required to um, foster like a successful relationship? Like, I would say it's really more for your survival because, you know, like if you are the only white guy on like on set and like there's like people with like guns and stuff and you know, you just really need to like fit in and just be chill with it. Mm -hmm. You're from the UK. It, I, okay, so let's, let's get into that. Um, I, there's a lot of things mentioned here that I can r relate to and I can understand where he's coming from when he says, I film a lot of music videos in the hood. You kind of have to fit into a certain extent. I think that means adopting vernacular. I think that means adopting a certain way about yourself. Uh, and judging off of the very little we know about the people he's describing, saying that like it's in the hood, you gotta be chill, uh, they are carrying firearms. I can imagine the sort of demeanor that you have to adopt. And what it sounds like he's describing is that 
you need to put yourself in the same, you know, sort of space and cadence as these people so that you fit in and you don't stick out like a sore thumb. Because if you've been in uh, areas like this and around uh, people of this nature, you you know you don't want to stick out because it's going to create a problem and, you know, it's going to get confrontational. From what he's describing, that's what it sounds like. Now, he's equating that with, I need to take on the personality of a black person, and that's where it you know, kind of lost me a little bit. I can understand that he's saying, I'm around black people who act this way, and therefore I'm taking on their character in order to fit in with them. Uh, but, of course, we know all not all black people act like... Uh, probably what he would be experiencing at these uh, music video shoots. Right. It almost, it, to me, it sounds like it'd be more dangerous to try to act like a black person uh, as a white guy in, in an environment like that. But I get it that if you're entering into a different subculture space, then you want to yeah. be deferential yes. and uh, respectful of the subculture and, and kind of not try to impose your way of life or thinking necessarily on that place in that as he was talking as you were talking my mind went to how uh, americans always are uh, complaining or, or talking about how they're afraid of going to paris for example because parisians are known to be hostile to mm -hmm. americans when they go to paris which i think is actually a little bit of a myth um they're generally nice but the i think where it comes from is the tendency of americans to be kind of loud and uh you know Cent they're, they're looking at the world very much through the American worldview and assuming that other people are just going to speak English and they're not sufficiently deferential to the culture when they're entering into that cultural space. And I think that kind of irks Parisians to where they won't want to help you, uh, even though they speak English and could help you if you come at them with, well, hey, brother, can you point me to the nearest McDonald's? You know, that's not going to come off very well. And mm -hmm. so I think what he's referring to is in a similar way if he's yeah. on set and policing people's language and saying, pull your pants up or something like that, then of course, yeah, he's going to get the crap beat up. Oh, yeah. And even more so than that, if you are like, uh, from my experience, uh, working with police officers who uh, are in areas that we would consider to be the hood that are, uh, you know, divided between people who are law abiding citizens and people who are uh, choosing to be gang members. These police officers, when they enter these neighborhoods and they're talking to people who, you know, they know are members of gangs, they know they get up to some like pretty bad stuff. They're not like, hi, how are you today, sir? No, they take on the vernacular of the community that they are policing so that there's this sense of camaraderie. I understand you, you understand me, and I'm not intimidated by you because I know how you are, I know how you think, I know how you speak. So you kind of have to show that understanding. And guaranteed, if you showed up in the area that I'm describing and you weren't meeting the law-abiding citizens, but in fact, you came across somebody who's a member of a gang or, you know, God forbid, multiple members of a gang and you do not fit in, meaning they do not recognize you. Uh, they know that you are vulnerable by from the way that you speak, the way that you come at them. It's not going to be a good situation. And I think from what he's described, that's exactly what you would be experiencing if you're going on to like a hip hop music video set with people who are, you know, brandishing firearms. They're probably more than likely part of a very similar community. And you can't just show up there like a little vulnerable white guy who's like, talking normally and, you know, is dressed all properly and buttoned up, you have to earn your stripes a little bit and show not only do I deserve to be in this room, but like you're not going to F with me uh, being here right now. I understand you. You understand me. So interesting. I'm, I'm curious how this is going to land, what he's going to what he said is going to land uh, with the people here. Great. Right. Do you feel like being like not having grown up with American culture as a whole and then especially not growing up with our subcultures? Do you feel like that's influenced the way you move when you're moving between our subcultures? My like mentality is kind of mixed because like from the age of like 13, I really started to, to learn English. From that, I really learned a lot. Like I really got the America like mentality more. And basically like my mentality is like mixed because like in uh, Ukraine, if, uh, if we see a black person, we call them the N-word. Mm -hmm. And from our side, it's not offensive, like we say it not from a offensive way, but some people can because, you know, like you don't see a black person there. I can understand that because I went to a school that was predominantly black when I was growing up. And when I first saw the first white kid, I was like, what is that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like it was a white girl with like red hair and I was like, whoa, I've never seen 
this before. You know what I'm saying? So like, I understand that like when a white person comes to a predominantly black group, then you're going to try your best to adapt to that, to our culture, to be like, okay, hey, I get along with you. This is my way of like telling you like, hey, this is, I'm like extending an olive branch basically. I love how understanding she was of what he just said. That, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm a little shocked to have heard such an understanding response to something like that. And maybe I shouldn't be so jaded in regard to like videos like this, but he just said something that could be very abrasive uh, to uh, the wrong type of person if you told them that at the wrong time. You know, in, in Ukraine, we call them the N-word. Like, just like, we don't view that as being a particularly negative thing, although sometimes it can be. I could see a lot of people taking that a very, very bad way. Uh, but there seems to be just like a an understanding and an empathy with his experience of being from somewhere different with a different culture, learning a new language, adapting to a whole new culture and having to navigate that without it being your first language. That's really interesting. And I'm glad she said, you know, I've had, you know, similar experiences with my first uh my first sort of exposure to white people. It would have been something super strange to me. I probably would have said, you know, like, who is that? Or thrown out some term that might not be the best thing to to have said. That was beautiful. Kudos to that guy. I kind of relate to that guy because uh, when I lived, when I was like 13 and 14, I lived in Brazil and my parents put me and my brother in Brazilian school in the mornings. And um, we had to just go in and just, learn the language, meet the kids. And I mean, we did a little tutoring before and then they just kind of threw us in. And one of the things I had to learn was that, you know, we had like a black kid in class and uh, they have two words for uh, black in Portuguese, or at least they have a word that you're supposed to call black people, which I believe is negro or like mm -hmm. it's spelled the same way as Negro. Um, and then the word for the color black is preto, P-R-E-T-O. And if you call a black person preto, it could be very offensive. And I remember being terrified of like getting that wrong. And hopefully I remembered it correctly. I think I did. Right. <laughs> but uh, so I, I relate to that, that when you're in different environments, like you have to Learn the right uh, terms and stuff. And good thing that he learned uh, quickly that using the N word in the U.S. is not as liberal, uh, liberally accepted as uh, in Ukraine. Yeah. And I imagine like I'm trying to think of that, of having that perspective. It's a perspective that I have not yet experienced in life of being somebody from a different country who's moved here. And you already have uh, a, a sort of pressure to assimilate, which I think is natural for any place that you would go to. But the added pressure of like taking on a second language, being in different subcultures of the now country that you live in, there's got to be a lot of pressure to like adapt to certain situations. I'm trying to think like if you picked me up and dropped me in the middle of, of China and I had to like figure my way around, learn a new language, adapt to certain subcultures within China, I would have absolutely no clue. You would just have to figure it out by like the feelings that you absorb from being around certain types of people. There wouldn't be a lot of a big frame of reference of, you know, how to be. Luckily, American culture is kind of everywhere. So you do, it's probably a little softer and easier to assimilate to, considering our media and entertainment is just all over the world, but it's still gotta be pretty tough. So, yeah. Personally, not to sound triggered, but I just don't like the notion that you're becoming a black person uh -oh. by pretending to be hood or no, adopting a hood mentality, like because thing. not all black people are hood, not all black of people course. are ghetto. I understand what you're trying to say, and I don't know if it's a language barrier, so I don't want to like come at you like I you're saying something racist, but I just really am anti-black people being defined as ghetto and hood, because there's a lot of classy black people out yes, there. Yes, there's a lot of intelligent Afro-Americans out there, and it really like depends on like where you grew up in. Also, if you are hood and ghetto like me, you can also be all those things too. White people also experience race-based prejudice. Of course, I strongly agree with this. I mean, we see it all the time now. Like, if you want to be racist towards a group of people, pick white people. You can do it openly. You can do it on the internet. You can have a whole platform based off of it. You can do it in jobs, in scholarships. Uh, you can outright say, I hate white people and I think they all should die. And people would be like, oh, typical leftist, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> nobody's going to really bat an eye at that, uh, which is crazy. Not to mention, yeah, there's just anybody, anybody can experience racial prejudice. That's really the heart of it. Uh, I don't even really need to give examples of white people experiencing it. They just can. It's just a fact.
Yeah, what was the company that was like, be less white? I mean, the examples are coming to my mind, but you're right, we don't. Yeah, Coca-Cola, that's right. Be less white. Woke a cola. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we don't, we don't have to belabor the point. Discrimination is is discrimination. That's certainly the case. But I did have to switch the camera to me because I got a little visitor. Oh! Romeo just hopped in my lap Romeo. because uh, it's almost his dinner time and his mom's not home. So uh, he can wait a little bit longer, though. Okay. <laughs> we'll get through this. We don't want we don't want Taylor's cat to starve, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Since you guys probably don't know, I have lived overseas. I've lived in Asian countries. In Japan, um, there are certain restaurants and stuff like that that you could walk into. You can see people dining in the restaurant and they're gonna tell you they're closed. There's a lot of racists all over the world, but there's a lot of racists in Asia. <laughs> I just gotta put that out there for you. There's a Thanks. lot of racists in Asia. Just because you're white or you're American. So the idea that white people can't really experience racism kind of contradicts the very definition of the word, because um, the definition of racism is prejudice based on one's skin color. Okay, white people sis. do experience it, but to a different degree. While I do think that our white brothers and sisters in Christ can experience racial-based prejudice, I don't want to overlook the nuance of that prejudice because it's not necessarily rooted in anything systematic or anything that's gonna actually have long-term effects. No. I don't know. Tell that to the universities and schools, tell that to the major corporations, tell that to our government with the ESG, tell that to any single institution that uh, claims to have an adherence to diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's a lot of systemic examples right now of, of this happening uh, toward white people. I don't have very many examples of it happening towards black people, though, in the present day. Uh, sorry. sorry. I got to say it. Knock on wood. That are going to, like, debilitate a race or, or inhibit their chances or possibility of succeeding or being seen as better than POC. I definitely think it's a non-issue, racism towards white people, especially specifically, I want to, like, in America. I don't think it's something that needs to be highlighted as an issue that is a constant threat to mm. lives, day-to-day -day well-being, pro progress and success in life in general, because it's not something that's going to inhibit you, and you don't have to walk out your door and think, I'm about to be attacked, like people of color do every single day. Um, that is not correct. Sorry, had to do that. I do agree that white people haven't been put through centuries of hell like black people were, but prejudice towards white people 100% exists. Like whether it's in TV, if it's in movies, like if you watch predominantly black media, there's a lot of roasting towards white people that if it was the other way around, that would never be acceptable today. Then it's you not even in predominantly black media. You gotta mm. let that be known. It's just regular media. Regular media hates white people, even when it's created by white people, which is insane. You go on social media like TikTok and you look up white people are bad, you will see videos where they are attacking white people for things that their ancestors did 200 years ago. There are societal benefits at this point for being a person of color and that mm. those negatively affect white people. Like if you look at affirmative action, diversity quotas in the workplace, all these different things, they lower the bar for black people, but then increase the bar for white people. However, I think where some of the the issue comes is because a lot of marginalized groups and people of color back in the day went through so much worse that it's easy for us to discredit the prejudice that white people now deal with today. I think like on an individualistic level, like yeah, white people get hate all the time. But I think if you zoom out and you look at the big picture, it's a little bit different. And like talking about like YouTube having, you know, racist content for anyone out there, it's like I would have to go and seek that out versus it like coming to me. You would think, uh, but no, it's not true whatsoever. Uh, you can just scroll on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and you can find it all. You're not gonna see any anything about race uh, racism towards other races for the most part. I don't know a platform where that'd be allowed except for like X maybe. X is maybe where you could actively discriminate towards any race and it would be able to uh, stay on the platform. But most definitely you can find a lot of like, just white hatred all over the internet. Now, it's probably not the internet that he's consuming. It's not falling onto his algorithm. You know, that that makes total sense. Maybe in his case, he does have to go searching for it, but it's pretty blatant on the internet these days. And just real quick, I mean, mm -hmm. even with his point about zooming out, if you zoom out, you should see the, the big picture of yeah. how we have institutional quotas that limit the number of white people that are being hired for jobs or admitted into universities, et cetera. Uh, we have in the mainstream media, in Hollywood, plenty of 
jokes at white people's expense that would never be done at the expense of other races. I mean, it's a it's an obvious real thing. So I don't buy the fact that if you zoom out, like, oh, the anti-white stuff's only happening in these small instances if you zoom out. No, if you zoom out, it become the problem should become more apparent if you're clear-eyed about it. Yep, it actually becomes a uh, systemic. <laughs> I know we don't like that word, but. Versus like on Twitter. Against white people? Yeah, I would have to like look for a video being like, oh, people who hate white people. I agree. Like mm. versus like Twitter, I don't have to scroll very long before I see some person making some out of pocket comment about yeah. And regulation being lifted so people can see that even more so. Right. Absolutely, that's 100% right. And even saying affirmative action, statistically be. and on paper, white people, white women, were benefiting more from affirmative action at colleges than any other demographic. So I also don't think that's fair to say, but I definitely get what you mean. And mm -hmm. again, I you're also counted in there too. I mean, uh, what was it? The, the University of North Carolina, where this was part of the uh, case brought to the Supreme Court uh, against affirmative action, where they're actively saying, you know, we're looking for people of color and they have to check this this box. And this was admissions officers at uh, at UNC saying exactly this. Same thing for Harvard and, you know, Yale and all these other major uh, institutions of education. And yes, while uh, white women also benefit from affirmative action by virtue of being women, another, uh, quote, protected class marginalized group in, in this country, you cannot deny that uh, black people, uh, Hispanic people, uh, indigenous people, not the Asians though, because they perform too well, are also majorly benefiting from affirmative action. And here, real quick, just mm -hmm. to substantiate that, I, I um, pulled up this stat I that's been trending on Twitter this past week. Uh, it's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics published by the Washington Post. It says corporate America pledged to hire more people of color. It actually did uh, in the years following in the year after the Black Lives Matter protest, the S&P 100, the top 100 companies in America added more than 300,000 jobs and 94% went to people of color. And there was a 904,000 uh number of is a re reduction in mm -hmm. the number of white employees in those companies as, since 2020. So this is literally happening at, at this scale. And yep. we actually even have statistics to back it up. So it's not like anecdotal evidence. And for this guy's point, like, again, he said, if you zoom out, um, then you'll see the discrimination against black people. But if you zoom out, it's you see the discrimination against white people. And yep. if you it requires you zooming in and taking those little niche anecdotal instances that he's seeing on his Twitter feed to substantiate his view. Yep, 100%. I mean, you guys saw it with your own eyes. Last week, we reacted to the CEO of United Airlines saying that he wants to have 50% of his staff be people of color or women. Uh, so uh, these things, they... They're not hiding These it. claims are not working out. Yeah, they're not hiding it. It's very, very much like public knowledge at this point. I think it's the prejudice is still there, though. And I will say that black people do deal with prejudice. I mm -hmm. think every demographic deals with prejudice. There are racist people everywhere. Like, I just don't think systemic racism is an issue anymore in today's society. Mm -hmm. But I do think mm -hmm. that there are racist people out there. I think that there's a really important distinction our language is constantly evolving, and you were talking about the definition of racism. Our societal definition has changed to include a systemic part of it. And I completely disagree with this idea that- No, it hasn't. People of color don't have systemic things against them still. Because the fact that we still have the KKK, the fact that we still have these things, and they are in positions of power. As long as that exists, and as long as that's a part of our country's like makeup right now, which it is, and that's our power structure, I don't feel like you can honestly <clears throat> deny systemic racism against the black community, which is why prejudice is so different from racism. I don't think white people can experience racism in this country. That is not correct. Okay, let's unpack that. First of all, this is a new definition brought about by the left that insinuates that in order to be racist, you have to have some sort of institutionalized systemic power. That is by no means the case. You do not have to have an institutionalized systemic power in order to be racist. You just simply have to be racist. You have to uh, you know, levy prejudice towards people, judgments, uh, view them as inferior based on their race, treat them differently based on their race. That is all that you need in order to be a racist. So there's no distinction to be drawn between racism and prejudice, really. It is, for the most part, the exact same thing, and white people do experience it. Now, she makes the point that uh, we still have people in power who are like members of the KKK, and they have this institutional power that they're utilizing against black people. Not true. Even if that was true, okay, let's say we have a, a sitting uh, senator right now who is also a member of the KKK. <laughs> okay, so if that was the case, it still would not be systemic racism. 
That would be an individual within an institution who happens to be racist, which we have a whole lot of, right? There's a lot of people sitting in Congress right now who are racist towards uh, white people, who absolutely harbor uh, as much racial animosity towards white people as they could possibly have, yet, you know, they're, they're passing laws that actually affect white people. Now, if you had a KKK member who is, you know, on the Senate or the House of Representatives and they actually got legislation passed that directly affects black people in a negative way, that would be institutionalized or systemic racism. Just having one individual who happens to be a racist, which I'll grant can happen. I'm sure there are racist judges, you know, police officers, teachers, yeah. lawyers here and there does not point to systemic racism. And the other elephant in the room is just ask yourself who controls the institutionalized uh, or the institutions of the, of the country? Who has systemic power in the United States of America? It's the people who share her ideology. So uh, according to her logic, it's if the people, only the people who hold power are the ones who can uh, be committing racism or mm -hmm. be charged with racism, then who are the racists uh, really? And it just goes to show you that they're not, I don't understand how that uh Cognitive dissonance doesn't kick in and, and wake you up. Yeah, I don't know. It's giving, it's giving ally. It's giving white guilt. But we can experience prejudice mm -hmm. based on the societal definitions we now use. Being sexually unattracted to a race is racist. I'm going to say... I disagree. I'm not going to say strongly disagree because I do imagine there are some people who lack an attraction to a certain race because of uh, racist, you know, narratives that they have going on in their head or something like that. But for the most part, if you have a racial preference in dating, I don't think it's because you're racist. It's just that you have a preference. Would I challenge that preference given that there are so many people in the world and I imagine that you'd be able to find one person within each race that you would find yourself attracted to? Logically, I would challenge it. But if somebody says, hey, I'm not super into dating, uh, I don't know, uh, Indian girls or something like that. I wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, you're a bigot. Just be like, oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I pretty much share that view. I mean, depending on how and and where and you know, how you're, you're raised, uh, certain preferences can just develop, uh, incident, develop incidentally. Mm -hmm. uh, that happens without any like malicious intent or any judgment assign that you're assigning uh, by your preferences. It's just kind of like we tend as human beings to go toward what's the more familiar yep. and who knows how preferences emerge in other ways. But if there is an element of like conscious, I don't like race X, Y, Z and have certain bias against them for some reason, then I would just gently maybe suggest that that is a little bit I don't know, illiberal, not you're ungenerous, and you're probably doing yourself a disservice by excluding so many people uh, from your potential pool that would otherwise be awesome people of high value, of high character right. uh, that you could have a, a lot of happiness with. So Yeah, there's a difference between like, I haven't met a blank type of person that I'm attracted to, and I don't date blank type of people because right. they are. That's like the two different things. That's why, yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll go disagree for this one. I think where the line gets drawn is when, if a white male is sitting there swiping and he's just like, I don't like black girls, they're all ugly. They have too big a lips. I think that's where the line gets drawn, but you can't really help what you're attracted to. Like my fiance is Mexican and it's like, I like him for who he is, not how he looks. I think that we are conditioned to um, be attracted and to respond to people that we grow, on, grow up and around with. So homogeneously, we grow up with people who look like us. So when you move into dating and things like that, statistically, you're going to be attracted to people that you grew up seeing, right? Mm -hmm. However, when you are discrediting um, a certain race for whatever reason based off their ethnicity, meaning everybody who did exist, is existing, and will exist from that race, you are not feeling anything. Cute, I don't control your body or your thoughts, but on one hand, I'm like, let's maybe unpack that. Also, where's my camera? To all the girls that's putting this in their bios, that's none of our business. Stop doing that. Keep that to yourself. We don't want to hear that. He's making good points. I just, something's off. His vibe, his vibe makes me feel weird. His vibe make he's very aggressive. I don't know what it is. <laughs> For me, I think that like, we're talking about conditioning and how we grew up, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to like South Africa, for instance, which within some of our lifetimes had apartheid. If you grow up in that, especially as a black person, 
where you're constantly being mistreated by every single white person and you're conditioned to be like, white person, no thank you. I don't think that's racist. I agree, and I obviously I'm, I did not grow up in South Africa with apartheid. Yeah. However, like I said, I the nickname extreme. of my town was Clancy. Like a lot of my interactions growing up were incredibly racist, and I'm dating a white guy. So I totally get what you mean. I don't want to discredit black people or anything. So wait a second. I gotta go back to that what that girl just said. I don't know what her name is. I apologize, but the girl in the sage top. So let's say you're a black person. No, no, let's say you're a white person who has only ever had negative experiences with black people. Every single black person you've met, you've always had a negative experience. Would she then think it's okay to say white people, n I mean, black people, no thank you. I'm not gonna, you know, date a black person. Would she hold the same energy for that? Because there, there's the possibility that anybody could have fully negative experiences with one race, but you would hope that if you have critical thinking skills and your logic is intact, you wouldn't let that paint the entire group of people. For logically, you would know that there are white people that aren't as bad as the ones that you've experienced uh, who, you know, maybe live in different countries, or there are white people in South Africa who disagree with apartheid and they uh, would treat you well had they had the opportunity to meet you or come across you. It's not logical. To, to think something like that, which is why at the end of the day, racial preferences, okay, they're, they're fine, but if you are basing them in an animosity towards a group of people, it doesn't really make sense. Anyone who's had those kind of situations, because it's not that they're not dating white people, it's yeah. definitely, it's more like, they're cautious. I think you used the perfect word earlier. Is it conditioned Ooh. or? <laughs> I, I, I actually, I was thinking about it on the terms of me being a black woman. I feel like it's a lot different when it is a black woman going into dating someone that is not of their race. Um, I can tell you from my experience with dating Hispanic men, white, whatever. They've only seen Jerry Springer and Maury. So it's like they have a whole different idea of what a black woman is. Like before my husband changed a lot, one of the comments made to me was he was afraid of me going to his house with braids in my hair. Yeah. Because then they would assume that I was a different kind of girl instead of looking at me for who I am. I have been denied access because of my race. No. Never, never happened to me, Taylor. Not that I can think of, though I'm glad I'm not uh, starting to apply for college or enter the workforce. <laughs> not right on now. a job hunt right now. <laughs> Doesn't have to worry about that. That's fair. Oops, I hit the wrong button. There we go. <laughs> I can go anywhere. I can sit down anywhere and I am not going to be denied because of how I look. And I would be ignorant to not admit that. But wasn't and she the one, well, this just as an example, she probably doesn't experience this in the US, but she was the one who said she went to Asia and that they wouldn't allow her to go in certain places because of her race. So, mm. but she said strongly disagree. I'm gonna counter that with, we are justifiably not let into spaces and our whiteness takes away access to things like powwows. And there's an island in Hawaii that's only for natives or for like safe spaces for black communities or whatever else. We are justifiably denied oh access. Oh my gosh, it's giving ally. It's giving ally. Somebody give her a trophy. White Stars guilt. Skin. Yes, for Period. real. We love the nuance. The thing about Hawaii though? Yeah. Hawaii is still on land. <laughs> I believe that they have every right to be able to say only we're allowed to go here because that it. was theirs. It was literally stolen land that was stolen by white people. Yes. <laughs> every single piece of land is stolen land. Oh, but that's why yeah. it's justifiably, it's still denied access. Yeah. But it is justifiable, 100%. Don't let yeah, me Yeah, it's in. denied access, but it's justifiable. But it's yeah. like in my own day to day life, I could go anywhere. I can sit down anywhere. I can go read a book in a library. I can go to Starbucks. People don't fear me because of how I look. And so they don't feel the need to be like, you can't be here. But like in, in your day-to-day -day life, are you being denied access? Like, are you trying to go to that island? That no. they won't let you, okay. Then I think that's a really good question. Like, am, like. like ha has it happened? Um, I guess. Cause like, are you seeking yeah. those spaces then? I'm not necessarily seeking them. If I am already aware that this is like, hey, this is for us, not for you. I'm not gonna show up and be like, yeah, but like, yeah. I'm a cool white person. But there are spaces that we are not allowed and I think that's okay. No, it is okay. But if you're not actively seeking to be part of those circles, you're not being denied access to them. I will agree with that. It's, sure, and I, like, and I can say that maybe those are not the best examples, but like, I think especially because my social circles are predominantly people of color, there are definitely things where they're like, where I've had them 
be like, this is not a conversation for you. And I'm like, okay, I have had those experiences. I'm okay with them. I want to be clear. Like, I think there should be spaces that aren't for me and that is okay, but they've existed and they've been in my life. I have just one really specific example. Otherwise, I feel like in general, I'm not denied access because of my race, just in my experience. But I had an ex whose stepfather was wildly racist, like Nazi memorabilia, like mm. just insane individual. Oh and I was never allowed over her house because yeah. of him. And the one time that I kind of snuck in, he was staring at me through the window. And I'll never forget that yeah. in my life, the way that man was staring at me through the window mm. and then cursed out his kids for having me in the house. That man's now in prison for doing God Something. knows what, <laughs> but uh, it's where he belongs. I was looking. It's interesting that that sort of ally answer that she gave backfired her on her in a way that they came after her for for having not actually been you know verbally denied placement in into these like powwows or meetings and stuff but there are a ton of different examples there's a lot of like leftist organizations and things that hold meetings and trainings and you know seminars that are just for people of color and if you are a white person who's at all interested in receiving a similar training uh, they will do like a, a white person only only one because they don't want you around the the people of color who are going through similar uh, circumstances or going through the similar seminars. So uh, it's a very very common thing. I guess she was trying to make a point and saying, yeah, I'm justifiably denied and like hell yeah, don't allow white people over there. And then it kind of kind of flipped back on her. It was kind of awkward, if I'm being honest. Oops. For funding for um, for my film and most of them are for colored people mm -hmm. and I totally understand that and there is like not many that I found that are for like everybody. My mind would be like, you know, ah, oh, damn, I cannot do it. Like I cannot apply to it. But from the other side, I understand that the black community, like you guys need to get, get your movies out there. If anything, I feel like I've been invited too much. You know, I, I, I feel real. like I'm kind of like a undercover agent where yeah. I'm like, like because I talk a certain way or because yeah. I present myself a certain way, they assume like, oh, I could say this 100%. in front of you. And I'm like, what'd you say? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm tokenized. Tokenized. I've never, real. I've never really it. been. I, no, I'll say that too. I've been tokenized yeah. so Amen. many times. I'm like, I don't want like, that. We right? have to have you here. We need young black representation. And yeah. I'm like, yes, I'm going to stay home. Yeah. <laughs> I am proud of my race. Three, two, one. I am proud of my race. Um, I think I would just disagree. I don't know. I've mm -hmm. never in my life uh, had a thought, uh, any sort of, any sort of thought that has ever pro crossed my mind that made me specifically think, wow, I'm so proud to be the race that I am. Not white, not black. I've never experienced that in my life. So. I guess I would put disagree. I'm inclined to really go strongly disagree. I don't, it just doesn't really make sense to me to be proud of the race that you were born as. It's a superficial characteristic, doesn't really mean all that much. Uh, I know we're told that it means so much and we're, we're given that narrative and it's like injected to our, into our brains these days, but I've never thought of something that I can distinctly attribute uh, to race that makes me feel some sense of pride towards it. Yeah. Yep. I'm with you. Totally. I yeah. strongly disagree uh, about this. There's nothing. I, what does being white even mean? Now, if you ask me about heritage mm -hmm. uh, or ancestry, like there's a lot. Like I've I've done a lot of uh, looking into my ancestry, and like I have a lot of Norwegians and Swedish in, in my family, and I got to go to Norway, go to the namesake, the tiny little, barely call it a town. Like 17 people live there in Norway, called Trendal, my last name, mm -hmm. um, and that was awesome. So <laughs> when you talk about heritage, yeah, I, I, I'm proud of that and love it. Um, but and when you talk about race and like skin color, it means absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yeah, like even with heritage, though, uh, for me personally, I'm like, OK, that's cool that like somebody somewhere distantly connected to me did that <laughs> thing. I don't feel any personal sense of pride that somebody who came before me like did something. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, sure. does that make sense? Uh, but I understand. I totally understand why people do. There's like a I think some people have like a very deep connection to uh, ancestry and, you know, mm -hmm. the work of those who who came before them. But I've never 
never felt that. Uh, I'm just I'm just a history buff in general, <clears throat> and uh, when I get to read about like Viking history and just imagine like I'd go all the way back to like prehistory and imagine okay what were just I just that fascinates me right. utterly. So it's not really anything that I think like oh Norwegians are better than other people mm-hmm. on the planet. I'm just like wow I have this sure. little bit of connection to this specific vein of humanity, and I kind of trace that back, and I just find that utterly fascinating and cool yeah. and like to learn more about it. So that's pretty much the extent of it for me. Fair enough. It is definitely fascinating. I will go first and I will stand 10 toes in. I was just being ironic to I stand over there. Okay, baby. I was like, please no. no I, 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 I cried a little bit. I'm being I think messy. That, like, and I'll just keep it. Really, why? That's such a weird, I don't know. Why, why do you have to feel a sense of pride towards your race? Why is that? Why have we been socialized to think that that's something that's important? Specific to to my experience of what I know, as Black Americans, we're pretty much the top culture that gets replicated, mm-hmm. referenced. People scoot in and scoot out because they want to seem cool and interesting and stuff. And I think that that's so kind of us to like kind of like be beaten down for so long and be kind of separated from our African roots, create names for ourselves, culture, language around our identities as Black Americans, and have that be a thing. Do I have a hot take brewing right now? Sorry, I have to cough. <clears throat> uh, I think I do have a hot take brewing right now. And the question is, what sort of personal onus do you have over any of that? <laughs> what sort of personal attachment do you have to any of that? I get that you were born in the race that has this cultural thing that it's done, that has influenced people, but like, why do you personally feel a sense of pride towards that? And if you do, why not feel a sense of pride towards other things that humans have created because we're all human beings, right? You, you don't feel a sense of pride for what other uh, races have done because you don't share the same skin color as them. It just really doesn't make sense to me. Is it just the ancestral web that makes you feel a direct sense of pride towards the people who share your skin color? Like I don't, like I, me as a, like a black person, I don't look at like something like jazz music, which, you know, has its roots in African history and things like that. And I don't feel a personal distinct sense of pride because you know, I other fellow Africans came up with said thing. I don't understand it. Maybe it's just something I don't understand, but I, I, I just don't know why you would feel. I think we have an inflated sense of self and an, an inflated sense of self-importance, and maybe that plays yeah. out in the pride that we feel for our culture, when really you have very little to do with any of that. Uh, is that is that a hot take? I feel like it might be. <laughs> I mean, it's it sounds like a hot take, but you're right. It is a it is a flimsy connection, if any. I mean, it, yeah. Like I think you can appreciate the roots and find it fascinating and interesting and all mm-hmm. that. But if you're like grounding your self worth in uh, those things, then I think that's where it's it's problematic. Just because that's it's a it's kind of a flimsy sort of shallow arbitrary thing. Uh, to ground your your sense of self and your your value as a person in those things. And I think that's maybe what you're speaking to is having uh, a sense of identity that's rooted in something deeper than just like this flimsy connection that you have based on arbitrary historical coincidence uh, to something like jack, jazz music, am I right? Yeah, and it just feels like, I guess, the default answer is to have pride in your culture. Therefore, anybody who has any sort of culture that they can find attachment to should feel, I guess, pride in their culture, which means it doesn't make sense to me. T- t- basically, it means <laughs> well, it doesn't I would make- say from like uh-huh. from my travels a little bit, like, my, like I said, with my parents as missionaries, when I would go to like places like Brazil or Cambodia or Myanmar uh-huh. or India, um, I just found that it, it's like you're looking at the uh, the diamond that is humanity mm-hmm. and seeing all its different facets uh, by seeing like the innate beauty and differences that have arisen in humanity in all these different cultural contexts and seeing how much we are very much the same yeah. and how much we're different. Um, but those differences each bring something unique to the table. And for me, I look at that and I'm like, that's kind of God showing me a little bit more of himself in the beauty that he's put in all these different uh, peoples. But the point is like each, each one brings something to mm-hmm. the table that it's expressing humanity in its own uh, unique and, and beautiful way. And so to 
it, so it's one thing to take pride in the one that you happen to be a part of and just say, yeah, this is cool. But mm -hmm. I don't think that should be to the exclusion of or elevating your own above any other culture in the world. I mean, we talk about like some cultures are better than others because they have better outcomes. And when we're talking about like organizing a civilization and um, organizing a country around ideals and things like that, then yes, you can you can make those distinctions. But on a like fundamental value, I believe like all cultures do have that inherent dignity and worth just like every human being has inherent dignity and worth. So when we get into these conversations, mm -hmm. I do think it gets a little weird when, and I share that concern with you when people are like trying to ground all this very profound stuff in things that are that are arbitrary. But I also kind of see the other side where there is like a depth and a richness and a beauty to all these things that should be appreciated as well. Yeah, 100%. And I think there's like parts we all have the parts of our culture that are going to like continue to grow through us and pass down to like the generations that come after us. And I guess that requires, does that require a certain level of pride in order to pass it down? That is, that is the question. Maybe I just don't like the, the word pride, pride. <laughs> because I, I certainly have a reverence for culture. I have a reverence for my own culture. There are going to be certain traditions from uh, my Nigerian side and then my like mixed European side that are going to pass through my family. I just don't feel a personal sense of pride toward those things, if that makes sense. Love to you own that Agusi stew. It's delicious. It's all <laughs> yours, Amla. <laughs> right, right, right. I do have a, I, I do have a, a deep love for uh, Igusi stew. That's very, very true. <laughs> that's just reverberating across the globe. I think that's so cute. Can never be replicated. Can never be understated. And um, I love that about it. That was kind of the start of my like thought process too. Like, just the basis of being torn down so adamantly, so regularly for hundreds of years in law even like it is insane that we are here today to even be on camera to even be in a place with other white people like it is a beautiful thing that we have been able to flourish in such dirt like literal filth and grime that our ancestors had to go through and even our grandparents had to go through like in my eighth grade yearbook i saw as did the ancestors of every other race i that must be very apparent i think there is a narrative uh, perpetuated uh, in this day and age that like black people and indigenous people are the only ones who have ever suffered any ills uh, historically. And that like, you can hear it in the way I think that she's communicating that she does indeed feel that way. And there is some sort of like, there's like competitive generational trauma sharing right now. Cause it's not even their own trauma, which is just even more dumbfounding, but it's like competitive. My ancestors had it harder than your ancestors had it. Uh, generally, it's never been a better time to be a human. And it's because all those before us have suffered. Uh, all those after us will suffer, you know, to what extent we do not know yet as progress and things like evolve. But meet every single race has ancestors that have been in uh, the, the dirt and filth. Might not have been at the same time, might have been in a different way but it is a shared experience uh, nonetheless. I recently said like the South will rise again, like, and this was 2015. So like, this is such a day to day thing and I am proud to be black and it's hard to say that. Like it was hard to say that as a kid, like, or else I could be called in where I could be reprimanded. And it's, I feel so blessed to even be able to think that. Everybody needs to be proud of their race and stop this like racist bullshit because like, you could be green, red, black, white, Hispanic, like, it doesn't matter. I agree with, like, what you're saying because my own personal belief is that at the basis of who we are is that we're all just people. We're not a skin tone. But because of those before me, I now have to fight back against the idea that all white people are racist. I remember being in fourth grade and learning about the Holocaust for the first time and saying, I don't want to be German anymore. Mm. Meanwhile, my mother's whole family is German. American history, you look at things like slavery, you look at things like um, Jim Crow laws, segregation. There is so much awful stuff that has happened and is still happening in closeted ways that I cannot be proud of the way that I look. Yeah, for me, like, I am proud of who I am, like who I grew up to be, like I like who I am, but like, if I were to say I'm a proud white man, like, I don't even know what that means. Like, <laughs> there have been zero racial hurdles in my life. Mm. Now, like, I'm a proud gay man because, like, I've had to go through shit to get to where I am now. Mm. And, you know, even to that point, so much of queer culture comes from black culture. So, mm -hmm. thank you. You're um, welcome. 
<laughs> it's just like this whole like self-flagellating, I have so much guilt, I cannot be proud of myself because of my ancestors. Uh, I can't get over it. Do you like if if you were gonna make I'm not I'm not inclined to make an argument for one being proud of their race. I don't know how important I personally view that to be. We've been over this already. But if you were to make the case for it, white people have contributed a lot to the culture that we're currently living in, a ton. And then you can break it down based off their personal ancestry and where they're from, and you would be able to track so many different things uh, that we now get to enjoy in current society that are the result of white people. It's so weird that we like pinpoint like slavery, Holocaust, therefore, Everything else that's come in the history before that and after that we must leave behind and we're not able to like say or state that we are proud of that for some reason. To me, it's just uh, it's just ridiculous. And interestingly enough, the one white person who stands on strongly agree and says I'm proud of my race is the one who was not born in America and doesn't have this sort of Americanized brainwashing to like hate whiteness and to feel no like sense of connection uh, to your race. And it, it just irks me a little bit to have these white people say, well, I, I don't think I could be proud of being white. You know, what if what is I ever struggled through from for being white and then have the black people just nod along like, yeah, I can stand here and strongly agree being proud of my blackness, but it's rightful for you to stand on strongly disagree being, you know, not proud of of your whiteness. Make that make sense. Make it make sense. Yeah, it's weird to me to like think that, OK, my race or people of my race committed uh, evils in history or of uh, or sins or whatever. And therefore, I feel a collective guilt regarding that and therefore mm -hmm. feel shame. Um, you know, guilt is like this happened and it, 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 I'm guilty of having committed it. Mm -hmm. Shame is I I am bad because of it. And uh that is is strange. But to me, the flip side is also true that if you are getting your sense of personal pride and self-worth from this idea that, oh, my culture has achieved these great things and right. I'm taking that on as my own because I share in that uh, achievement just by virtue of of my my heritage or skin color, that's equally wrong. And it's it's insecure on both sides. What What I'm kind of trying to communicate is that in the same way that you know, I believe every human being ha it has an inherent uh, dignity because they're made in the image of God. I think every culture uh, has an inherent dignity uh, for the same reason or kind of on the same basis. And mm. that's what gives you the the value to stand on in, in my worldview. And, and so and just to speak for myself, when I'm um, saying that I would maybe take pride in my heritage or whatever, that's what I'm speaking to in the same way that I would say, like, I, I have a leg to stand on uh, in my dignity as an individual because uh, of that, in, because it's intrinsic and not because of my ancestors' uh, achievements. And I don't have less of an I of a value because of my ancestors' sins. So it's just sad to see this, like you're saying, self-flagellation. Um, and then on the other side, you see this, the kind of virtue signaling where they're getting a sense of uh justification, a sense of I, I'm okay in the world. I'm an okay person because I acknowledge these sins and I'm on the right side of everything. And it, it just seems like we should, we should just start from the point of like, man, don't, don't think you have to pay for your ancestor sins. That's wrong and be insecure because of that. But don't think that because you've inherited good things from your ancestors, that that's the basis of your standing in the world either. Uh, just be you and take the world as it comes, but don't stake your identity on these spurious things. Yeah, it's like weird to me that in today's culture, if you are a person of color, you are viewed as being like culturally rich. Like you have this deep culture that you are by by virtue of being born attached to and white people don't have that whatsoever. There's no, <laughs> which how many times have you heard white people don't have culture? It's like a, everybody gets to say that all the time and it's the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard. Uh, but you you don't get this just like default sense of cultural richness just because you're born with a certain skin color. It's just unbelievable. And the fact that people carry that around with them and cre turn it into their own sense of self-importance is even like way more concerning uh, because they're not detaching themselves from the fact that like others 
created what you are now feeling a sense of pride in, if that makes sense. I want to be proud of the things I've done, the people who I've touched, whose hearts I've opened up. I feel like it's beyond our race. I feel like what it is is our experiences yeah. that make our light shine through. So that's what I'm proud of, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that there's a really big difference between being proud to be black and being proud to be white. So being proud of your culture, it. beautiful thing. Like, be proud to be Ukrainian. I'm proud to be Slavic. The black community is different, and the reason it's different is because their culture, specifically black Americans, their culture was stripped, like, stripped away from them when they were brought over here. So then oh, the culture gracious. became being black American. Your, like, the race became cultural. I mixed that up, so sorry. It, I also just wanna like, challenge this idea that culture is completely stripped of some, what do you mean culture is completely stripped of you? When you, you mean your own experiences, traditions that you, you have, you have knowledge of are stripped away from you when you move to another place. I can acknowledge the fact that obviously when living in slavery, you don't have any room to like practice your cultures. Although it's actually not true because a, a lot of uh, things that we now experience in American culture are products of slaves, uh, you know, bringing their culture over during the transatlantic slave trade, sharing that amongst themselves, and then it prol proliferated onto what we now experience uh, here. That is culture being, uh, you know, uh, traveling from uh, one right. part of the world to another. So you got to be honest in that. And if we're going to look into white culture, if you're arguing that slaves were stripped of their culture, there's a ton of, of white uh, cultures and backgrounds that would have the very same claim to be able to make. But the thing is, culture does carry over. I mean, even if like you are stripped of all, if I'm stripped of all my belongings today and sent somewhere, you know, uh, I still would carry with me Culture. I know you're not able to say that because it makes it sound like, uh, oh, slaves had good things going for them too. That's not what I'm saying. It's just to say you can't be 100% stripped of your culture. And the very same leftists would say that we borrow a lot of things in today's culture that came from slavery. So Right. It's like they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. They're saying, like, on the one hand, this culture was robbed and totally stripped away from them. And on the other hand, uh, if you participate in black culture and you're a white person, you're stealing that. Yeah. And they survived and preserved their culture. So which is it? It's like, did they did they preserve their culture and, and survive and create this beautiful thing that everyone else is now borrowing from? Or was it all completely stolen and gone? Does this make sense? Let us know. Let us know. No, about the yeah. But like, yeah. so I think that there's a really big difference between like, I am proud of my people. My people are Slavic versus I am proud of my race. It just gets convoluted because black Americans, the race has become the culture because mm -hmm. the culture was stripped away. But that's not the truth for all black Americans. There's a, t oh, yeah, yeah, I never mind. I also think oftentimes when you talk about white pride versus black pride, oftentimes mm. black pride is rooted in like love and like perseverance of like mm -hmm. culture, customs, language and things like that. And white pride is often rooted in like Black hate, yeah. black Facts. hate, Facts. Asian hate. So I think that's like uh, an interesting. Um... That's your association uh, of white pride. And that white pride, if we're going to talk about like uh, maybe like a neo Nazi's view of white pride, for the most part, seems to only exist because you haven't allowed white people to be proud of their culture and you haven't allowed space for them to be able to espouse those views and therefore they become radicalized. That's not to say that's the case for all neo-Nazis, but it is for a lot of them. So if you associate white pride with hate, we need to get down to the bottom of that because you're not allowing for any other form of white pride. A white person is not allowed to say, I'm proud of, of my whiteness and here's why. It's, I'm proud of my whiteness, fired, canceled, deplatformed. There's, there's no conversation. Uh, so if the hate seems to be bubbling through your examples of white pride, it's because like people are radicalized in that direction. And that's all you're going to hear is the people who uh, feel so much hatred and animosity that they're willing to uh, scream their white pride out loud, if that makes sense. No uh, white person in today's time is going to be able to say they're proud of their race, which is why all three of the American whites in this video went to strongly, strongly disagree when asked if they were proud. Nuance to not yeah. <laughs> overlook. No, and it's, I think that's such an important point. I think there's a difference between like, I'm proud and therefore I'm better 
versus I am proud of what we have overcome. Yeah, and then the whole idea. Oh my gosh. Okay, there's a lot of people saying I'm proud uh, and I'm better, but pride does not have to do all only with overcoming. Uh, achievements are not always something that you've overcome. The creation of a culture is not always something that is overcome. It is just something that you have created. It is just something that comes about yeah, th just naturally through human progression and being around one another. It's this like obfuscation of certain definitions that really gets to me. Changing racism to in order to be a racist, you have to be in in power and that's different than prejudice and people can experience prejudice but it's far different than uh, experiencing racism pride you feel pride when you overcome something and because I'm white I've never overcome anything that's why black people get to espouse their pride and we don't these are not the real definitions of these words these are like new left-leaning socialized definitions of mm -hmm. these words that are now being shared. And just for the record, let's just uh, pull up the definition of pride. Definition of pride is the feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. It has nothing to do with overcoming something. It has nothing to do with the history of systemic racism or, you know, overcoming slavery or the trans transatlantic slave trade. It's just feeling pride in your accomplishments or those you are associated with. Of white pride started with people who think the Confederate flag is personality trait. <laughs> so how can I be proud of that? Drag, <laughs> yes. I'm not saying that this applies to any of you, but mm -hmm. I meet a lot of white people, particularly white liberals, who will actively say that they're ashamed of being white. And that is wild to me, because how can you look at your past? And because, yes, your race did terrible things in the past, but you shouldn't define yourself as that. If anything, you should look at that and reflect. So do you think white people should be proud to be specifically white? See, I think that's a really nuanced question when you're white because I think you guys had the valid point of F If you want to be, yes. All these black people, I'm sure, uh, you know, if we go and look into their ancestry, you're going to find an ancestor that did some fucked up shit. You are. You're, <laughs> you're going to find somebody who did something wrong. You know, for some of them, you might even find ancestors who actually enslaved people. Uh, so... Uh, are you now supposed to not feel pride uh, in your black race because one of your ancestors enslaved somebody back in the day? No, it doesn't make sense, guys. It doesn't it's make just, sense. yeah, it's it's again. I keep going back to it's just poor grounding for a sense of pride, and I'm I'm starting to agree more and more with you, Hamala, that it's such a weak thing to try to use to say I take pride in. Uh, what my ancestors have overcome or what they've achieved. And right. uh, when I when they talk about like KKK people and white supremacists, like I imagine that either it's re like you were saying, reactionary to them not being given space to just express or any association with or any any grateful gratitude or, or pride in their association with uh, their race uh, and reacting to the fact that there's an asymmetrical uh, playing field in our culture right now about mm -hmm. that. Or uh, they're looking at the achievements of white people in civilizational history and saying that those belong to me. But again, it's like, what have you achieved as an individual in your creativity, in your character, in your productivity, in uh, being a good friend, being a husband, a father, or something right. like that? Like, generally, it strikes me as like an a, a poor, cheap substitute for the pride you should actually have in uh, being a good person and achieving things in your own life and being uh, construct being a constructive force in the world, a force for good. Like yes. those are the things that we should primarily be taking pride in and finding our identity in, uh, as opposed to trying to just draw these connections that oh, because of jazz music or because of what's been overcome or because of Western civilization and the Enlightenment and and things like that, then, oh, the, all those achievements belong to me. And that's what I'm grounding my sense of dignity and self-worth in. It's like, yep. the, that you're so far removed from that. What have you, what, who are you? And you can't take credit for that. We can all be grateful for things. We can appreciate the things yes. that have been brought to the table by different cultures over the decades. And, and we can be proud that we have a loose maybe connection to them. Uh, but that's a different thing from thinking like, 
I I have achieved something just by virtue of being connected. Right. And by the same token, I'm guilty of something just by virtue of being connected exactly. to something negative. Because we could play that game all day long and never get anywhere. But what will move us forward in our personal lives and in society as a society is when we start taking pride in our values, in our creativity, in, our, in the things that we're doing uh, to make the world a better place. Yeah. If you are not connected to the horrible things that your ancestors done, have done, what makes you think you're connected to the great things that they've done? You're really not. Like these are separate individuals who led their own lives. And of course their life led to yours. And that deserves like a reverence and a respect. But like concerning yourself with a personal sense of pride over those things doesn't really make sense to me. And I think, yeah, it's just like a cheap alternative to like actually having a sense of self and actually developing your own yeah. place in, in the world. Ethnicity is different because like white isn't a collective culture in the way that black is because black people have been grouped together and have a similar experience. But with like white, like Italian American, you should definitely be proud of being Italian American. You should be proud of being Slavic American. You should be proud of your lineage. But just to say, oh, I'm proud to be white, like yeah, that has a weird connotation to it because it's not a collective culture. But what I really want to emphasize is that you should not be ashamed oh, she, of being white in the way that a lot of people are. Mm. I can't. I can't deal with it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm gonna get, you might think I'm being rude for that, but oh my gosh. Um, yeah. N Stop it. It's so funny because like, the people who are telling white people that they can't have a sense of pride in their race because white people are so splintered into like different sectors and, and things like that are like the very same ones who are pushing this narrative of whiteness. So like, which one is it? Do they function as a collective with a shared culture and a shared guilt that you can judge them based off of because of their whiteness? Or do they not? <laughs> so like, wh you tell me which one it is. And the same goes for black people. I bet if we go and like look into the lineage of um, the, I think the four black people who are in this video, it's gonna splinter off into very different regions with very different backgrounds. And I would venture to say that uh, maybe some of them don't even have uh, ancestral slaves in in their chart. So what is so do you guys share an entire black culture that you now get to be proud of? I have a lot of questions, guys. I could unpack this for hours and hours and hours. I'm not going to go that far. We made it to the end of this Jubilee Spectrum video. <laughs> I think we cracked the code on this, though. I mean, I'm I'm very content with the conclusions that we've drawn about it. Not to say that we're high and mighty and got it all figured out, but right. and um, I I don't need to listen to any more of that conversation <laughs> because it seems like we got to the point where any more would just be going around and around in circles on this endless game of whose ancestors did what and why you know this is good and that's bad or whatever. And um, I think we uh, unpacked enough of it. Yes. Now we are going to kick the ball over into. Uh your court, I guess, guys, you let us know in the comments down below how you felt about the different topics that we discussed in today's video. Any points that we missed, any points where you disagree, as always, I encourage healthy debate. So do get out, but do so respectfully. And uh, if you like this video, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we post a video for you guys, which is every day. And I will see you next time. Bye, guys.